And I thought we might just take a moment and have a look at this first slide. There's a lot of eyes in this slide. I was, I had, I worked, I did, I might, I am, I never, I swore, I will. And this first song has a lot of eyes in it. We're going to be talking about eyes today, but maybe not these eyes. I've worked my fingers to the bone. I swore I'd do it on my own. And I asked the question, do you really think you can do anything without God's grace and grace alone? Let's stand and give thanks for God giving his grace to us.
My name's Greg and I'm one of the brothers who worships here in Jeringong in this family of God and I welcome visitors today and all our young families back from their holiday away. Was it a holiday? Yes? Yeah, the young kids had a great time. We're going to say a prayer now together. It has a bit of a rhyme to it, but if you believe that Jesus has set you free just as we were singing then I'd love you to join with me in this prayer Lord I'm so grateful for what you've done in me you've taken my sin and set me free thank you for taking my sins to the cross where you suffered and died when I was so lost my, my, my lust, my envies and greed Forgive me my sin, this I do plead For nothing happens to me that you do not know You carry me through the highs and the lows Help me, I pray, in whatever I face To know I'm a recipient of your mercy and grace Amen Hello everyone, welcome to our family spot. Uh, I can't take the credit for that picture, that was Greg. And, uh, but I just thought I'd tell you about something that we do at the evening service uh, when I'm leading. I do a thing called Spotlight, where I put the spotlight on one member of the congregation and they don't know I'm going to do this. And so I thought that today for our family spot, we could actually have a family spotlight. And so I thought I would pick one of the people from our young families who went away last weekend so they can tell us all about it. I thought I'd, uh, maybe two, I was gonna go with a grown up, but uh, yeah, I thought this could actually be a different family spot where we actually hear from a grown up. I'm really smart. <laughs> yes, there you go. I don't, I don't think you need opportunities to speak. I think you take them anyway. <laughs> uh, all right, you can come up. You can come up. Come on, Rose. Come on, Rose. Yay. All right, you stand there. Okay. So, tell me about the weekend last week. What did you do? Where did you go? How was it? Um, it was very good because we lost, we forgot the key from for the, um... Okay, so that's specific <laughs> detail, big picture, because okay. most people don't know where you went, what you did, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, it was a big house. It's a big house. <laughs> you see where I was going with the grown up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there was small bedrooms. Okay, big house with small beds. There was a big hall. Yeah, so a Christian conference centre. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and we played um, past Dalla Dalla. Oh, Dalla Dalla, that's <laughs> right. Bureau Lakes it was, a place called Bureau um, Lakes, right on Wairo Beach. The beach was very, very rough. Mm -hmm. and was it fun? Yeah, yeah it was. Oh. Um, <laughs> We nearly all nearly got swept away in it. Oh goodness! Um, oh, you're here today. That's good. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we played lots of games yeah. and had lots of breakfast. 
oh, and wow. lots of food. Sounds and we had good. a campfire and roasted loads of marshmallows. Oh, it sounds lots of fun. Okay, well, you can go sit down now. And I'm going to put the family spotlight on Ruben. Have you come, Ruben? I'll actually grab this mic so that the recording picks us up. So, Ruben, you use that one? Thanks. <laughs> so, tell us about last weekend. Where did you go? What happened? Did you enjoy it? All those sorts of things. Okay, all right. I'll see if I can do uh, the best job I can. Um, so basically last weekend we went to uh, a place called Burrow Pines. It's, who's, uh, we, who's we? Uh, sorry, okay, so <laughs> uh, how many families? There was about, yeah, <laughs> I think there was, uh, we had six families in total. Um, so uh, there was 18 kids and 11 adults, I think from memory. Uh, so a big, big group, uh, 29 of us. And uh, we basically went to, uh, yeah, it was a conference centre, uh, Burrow Pines, um, yeah, uh, as Rose said, not far from Ulladulla, perfect, spot on. Um, and we, uh, so it was, a, it was a beautiful location. The, the conference centre itself is very close to the beach um, and the, it's sort of integrated with another campsite. So there were other campers around, but we pretty much had this facility to ourselves. Um, and yeah, it was great. We had the dining room, um, kitchen, and there was uh, six uh, individual units as well. And what was the best part? Oh, the best part. That's a hard one. I think uh, you could say it was just... Two, two best parts. Two, <laughs> um, the two best parts, probably, you know, when I, when I was there, we, um, we caught up with the, the facilitator of the, of the lodge and uh, he said it was just really inspiring to have a big family, good, you know, big Christian set of families like us there. And I think that was really encouraging for us to, to know that we were actually there to, to help support them and, and, and they felt encouraged and obviously that encouraged us as well. So it was just a big thing to know that we could support, you know, um, this, this Christian uh, missionary uh, facility. But also, you know, he, he put it so succinctly when he said, you, you know, you, you, just, you just do life together. And I think that's important is because we, you know, we see each other at church on Sundays, uh, which is great. You know, it's a way to bond and socialise. But when you're actually doing life together, that's very different. And, you know, I think that really just draws um, the families together on a whole new level. That was Any other good parts? <laughs> uh, and, the, and I guess the second part was probably, yeah, the marshmallows are pretty cool. I think the, the campfire and marshmallows, okay. yeah, you agree, yep. kids, yeah. And was it all fun and games? Uh, mostly, yes, I think, you know, but yeah. we, did, we did have, um, you know, we, we, we wanted to make sure there was a good combination of fellowship and, um, you know, kind of recreation. So we, uh, we had um, some communion, you know, which was led by Sarah Ellis. She did a great job of that. And, you know, we had plenty of opportunities to pray, pray, uh, pray as a group, you know, particularly at meals. And, yeah, uh, other than that, we just, you know, like things like the campfire uh, were great to do as a group. And then we also had time where we just relaxed, you know, I individuals as families or just at the beach together. So, yeah, it was good, good to have a combination. Fantastic. Okay. Well, it's great that you had such an awesome time. I guess the worst part of it was having to come home at the end of the weekend. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, we missed you here last Sunday, but everyone was really thrilled that you were away having a good time. So praise God that the families were able to, to have a great time. Thank you for all your effort and everyone else who chipped in to make it happen. Uh, it was a, a wonderful weekend. I know Steve and I enjoyed the time we got to spend down there. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming up here and uh, you're going to be organising the big church house party later on in the year now yeah, that you've had the... <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, maybe not. No, no, no. Don't worry about thanks, that. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks everyone for your prayers as well and support. I know, you know, it's, it's not just one individual. It's, it was all the families that supported us, but all the church as well. And obviously there's much uh, higher level support going on too in the background. So thank you. What, as part of news today, I wanted to, to catch up on something I should have done last week, but didn't get the opportunity to do that. Um, and some of you will be aware that last year we uh, took on board a new mission organisation, an organisation called Zambia's Child. And uh, well, I just wanted to give you a very brief update, let you know a little bit about what's going on there. For those of you who know nothing about Zambia, here's a few facts about Zambia that you might find interesting. 60% of the country live below the poverty line, uh, which is pretty astounding in our day and age. 
Um, very high unemployment, but it has very, it's very resource rich Zambia, um, one of the largest producers of copper in the world. Uh, but uh, all that money that comes from the copper doesn't stay in the country. Um, beautiful multinational companies like, for countries like, well, Australia, um, take that, uh, that mo all the money from that and uh, take it out of the country. So there's very poor infrastructure uh, in the country, very poor roads, electricity um, keeps getting cut off all the time, water, that kind of thing. Um, and th because of the great poverty and because of the impact of AIDS, uh, particularly, uh, many Zambian families have not just their own children, but uh, relatives' children or just children uh, that they are vaguely connected to uh, living with them. So it's not unusual that for people to have you know, 10 or more children living in the house with them um, as they care for them, even though they are below, living below the poverty line. And so that's a, just a little snapshot, just if you get want a bit, a bit of an idea of what that poverty looks like. Uh, I had the privilege of going over there a couple of years ago, uh, and this is just showing you the inside of somebody's home. Um, and so most people will live in a mud brick home, a bit like that, a bit of corrugated iron on the roof. Um, we complain about the roof on the cottage. Well, that's nothing compared to uh, the kind of things they're living on, uh, they're living in. Uh, you'll see there the, the windows are tiny, if they have windows at all. Uh, people don't, they can't afford the glass, so they'll usually just block up the windows to keep the rain out. Um, and so it gives you a bit of an idea. Often a bed like that you see at the bottom would have probably about four or five people sleeping on it. Um, if they slept on, didn't sleep on that, they'll sleep on the floor. So the poverty is just, it's, it's just beyond our understanding experience. Um, but it's partly because of that, that uh, a, a number of years ago, but there, in fact 10 years ago, 2013, Zambia's Child started. Um, Kim Makuka, who is uh, kind of the founder of, of this organisation, uh, went over there and saw these children living on the streets or spending time on the streets during the day, not going to school. Um, because although they have public education, you still have to pay for books and exams and uniforms, and most families can't afford that. And so a lot, a lot of kids, most kids, uh, aren't able to go to school. Uh, and so she thought, well, wouldn't it be great to be able to have, to provide an opportunity for all of these children to be educated? And so the idea of starting um, Ipalo Christian School, uh, uh, ICCS, Christian Community School, was started. Um, and so it started in very humble beginnings. That You see the top picture there is the classroom that they met in. They hired a local community hall um, and they started off with just 30 students from one class. Um, and then each year after that, they've added another class. And so first year was year one. Second year they had year one and year two is that they brought in another 30 or so. Each of these children is totally sponsored by people from Australia. Um, and it is mostly people from Australia. There are a couple of people overseas now, but um, initially it was just people from Australia. Uh, and so each one of those students is provided a uniform, all the books, all the teachers are paid for, um, and they provide a meal for them every day. And so you'll see it on the right-hand picture, uh, a picture of them cooking lunch. And so they did originally just cook it on a balcony, on a, um, a veranda outside one of those, those rooms. Uh, and so they would cook generally um, some kind of protein, so chicken or eggs or something like that. Um, a staple, which would be uh, what they call mealy meal, which is like a, a maize meal. Kind of, it looked a little, a little bit like mashed potato kind of look um, and some kind of vegetable. And so starting off with 30, 30 children, that was doable and they'd get the mums to help cook. After a couple of years, um, they had the privilege of, of actually buying some property um, just outside one of the townships. And that, the picture in the bottom is a picture of, uh, of that property. That's a, a large anthill you can see there. Um, and they, they actually use those anthills to build the mud bricks because they're very, uh, they're very solid. And so they're, they're useful for building the mud bricks houses. And so that's what the property looked like then. Now, some 10 years later, it looks like this. Um, and so there's a number of classrooms. There's about nine or, tw or 12 classrooms. I can't remember the exact number. Um, and so each year they've been adding an extra classroom as, they, as the kids get older, they, they plug in another classroom at the bottom. Uh, and so they're now up to year 11. So this year, this year we've got year 11s there. And because we're in high school, the kids are in high school, they need to have things like science labs and computer labs and those kind of things. So the bottom picture is a picture of what, the science lab. Uh, one of the new science labs has just been finished. And so they'll do similar curricula to what we've been doing here in Australia. Um, those kinds of similar kind of things, all those different subjects. And they're still providing a meal. So though they've got over 350 kids, um, they're still providing a meal every day. And so that's just a picture of them um, having their meal. You get a bit of an idea. I can't, 
you may be able to see the different, uh, the white substance is the, the, the mealy meal uh, and they have the other things there. So uh, the school has grown quite incredibly. Um, so now as I say up to year 11, the goal is to have um, students right from uh, preschool because the, in Zambia uh, schools need to start in preschool, not in year one. And so starting from preschool and going all the way to year 12. And so this year and next year, instead of adding 30 students, we're actually start adding 45 students. Um, one, one for year one and a half a class of preschoolers. And then next year we'll add the other half of the preschool class and year 12. And so then it'll be, from next year, it'll be the full size. And so now on the property, we've got things like water tanks, uh, bores, that, so they get fresh water. Um, they, they've got, now got electricity um, attached to the school, which is fantastic. Um, so they don't, uh, but they've also got solar power on the on the, a lot of the buildings, so that they don't get um, impacted so much by the 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 power shedding that, that happens. Um, they have computer labs. They also have a, an agricultural plot or a couple actually uh, that helps provide the food for the 400 children or or so. And so they have chickens which they raise for eggs, but also for meat. Um, they have uh, all sorts of different vegetables that they have and the excess stuff that they, they grow, they sell at the markets to then come back to the school. So the school is growing and doing great things. It's a Christian school uh, and so all the teachers are Christian and they have a very solid Christian education. They pray with all the kids and um, sing Christian songs with them, which is fantastic. Uh, one of the newest things that's happening started this year is a boarding home and we, we have for many years, we hoped to have one but didn't, couldn't see how that could possibly happen. But we got a, a generous donation from a, a company in, in the UK, uh, which has actually helped us to build a number of different blocks. And one of the things they've helped us to build is the boarding house. And so starting at the beginning of this year, 24 girls uh, came into the boarding house, which is fantastic, very exciting. And uh, next, we're hoping in the next year or so that they'll be build another building to have 24 boys in there as well. So, because obviously you can imagine if you're living in a home with 11 kids in one room, um, it's not really conducive to great studying, is it? So um, for those who are, are most in need, the boarding house is available for them. So that's very exciting. Um, and so that's give you a bit of a, a, a real quick snapshot of where the school is at. Just a few things that you can be praying for. These, these notes will be on the, the uh, monthly prayer sheet, so that comes out in a week or two's time. So uh, what can we pray for? We can pray for, uh, give thanks to God that we're now an exam centre. You know where we do HSC here in, in New South Wales, um, the kids come to their school and they, do, they sit for the HSC and they can sit in the library or the hall or wherever it might be and they can sit in a place that's familiar to them. Well, in Zambia, they, they have external exams as well in year 7, 9 and 12, uh, but not all schools are able to conduct those exams. So the kids ha have previously had to go to other places to do their exams, which is a bit more, more stressful for them. But that we thank God that they're actually now able to do those exams in the school, which is fantastic, so we're thankful for that. Give thanks to God for the completion of the, the different stages, particularly for the boarding house, and pray for those girls, uh, that, for, the, for safety for them, uh, but also that that will be a place where they can make the most of the education that they're, they're receiving. Pray for wisdom, um, not just for the school programs, but for student selection, because you can just imagine it, um, there's a, each year, it starts about the middle of the year, you have to go out into town and people will apply to come to the school and you have to go and decide who are the poorest. And so you might go to one particular house and find, well, you've got, a parent, you've got both parents, well, you, you, you obviously won't be able to come. Or you, you may be living below the poverty line, but we still can't. And so you can imagine how hard, heartbreaking that must be. Uh, and so each year they have to go through and they try and find those who are who are going to be able to uh, make the most of the, of the opportunity that they're given, but also that, who are most in need. And so it's a really fantastic ministry, and I want to encourage you to pray for it. Please pray for the safety and protection. Pray for uh, Amos Simfukwe, who is the, the principal of the school, and he uh, is an amazing guy, um, but also he's a little bit sickly at the moment, so you can pray for him. Uh, and continue, continue to pray for the building projects. They're, they're trying to build a, a, a hall, a gymnasium kind of thing. It's one of the other things that's going to be coming up. Uh, and also pray for student sponsorships because every year we need another 30 or 45 for the next two years uh, student sponsors. So if you're interested in this, in this ministry, um, obviously please keep praying for it uh, as we do each month uh, through the um, prayer sheet. Um, but also... If you're interested in sponsoring a child, there's still children who, are, who, um, who aren't sponsored at the moment. 
say that the organisation is, is paying for them until we can get a sponsor. Uh, so please pray for them. And, and if you're interested in sponsoring a child, go to Zambia, search J Zambia's child online. Um, you do it on the kind of computer thing, you know, worldwide web. Um, Zambia's child, you'll be able to find it. Um, and you can actually, one of the, the great privileges, you can, are able to go over and visit. Uh, there is a, visit, uh, a group going over there soon for the 10th anniversary of the, of the organisation. I would have loved to have gone, but unfortunately he wasn't able to do that. Um, but you are able to go over. We, we are at the privilege of going and helping the school. Lorne was doing, um, helping with the students doing testing um, of phonics, that kind of thing. I was doing PTC with some of the pastors in the churches and others. Um, you can go and help in the school in all sorts of different ways. And if you are sponsoring a child, you can actually meet them, go to their home and, and, um, and give them a gift or whatever it might be, just get to know them as, uh, personally. So if you're interested in doing that, you can do. Also, you can, you can share this work with other people because we're always looking for new, for new people to get involved. So, please. To sponsor a child is about $500 um, a year, uh, which is not huge. Um, and one of the exciting things about this ministry is that 95% of that money actually goes to Zambia because all of the work in, in Australia is done by volunteers. So uh, there's very little administrative costs here. So it's all going to where it goes. So I just wanted to get you up to speed with that and let you know what's, what's going on. If you want to find out more, come and talk to me. I love talking about it. You might pick that up. Um, but yeah, it's a great exciting ministry. Please be praying for it. Um, just before we move on, there's a couple of other things of news just to bring to your attention. One is that on the 1st of April, which is a couple of weekends away, two exciting things happening. What are they? Does anyone know? The, where, uh, Working Bee came out first. I can't believe it. Um, but the prayer meeting is on for, at 8 o'clock. From 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, as every month, we're having the Working Bee, the, the prayer, our church prayer meeting. And then from 9 o'clock onwards, the Working Bee will be starting just to spruce the church up for uh, Easter. So last time we had 60 people help us at our working bee, which is awesome. We'll get some extra chairs out for the prayer meeting so you can come and join us for that too. Um, but that would be really great. So that's on the first. The weekend after that, of course, is Easter. And so uh, on Good Friday and Easter Day, we're having our rig what we usually do at Easter. So we'll be having on Good Friday, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. Um, and then on Easter Day, 8, 10 and 6, our usual three services. So please be praying for those. Great opportunity to come and uh, to invite people to come uh, and to celebrate the reason uh, for Easter. Uh, that'd be really great. I think that's all I've got. Oh, BCA boxes. For those of you who have BCA boxes who still actually collect change or maybe you give donations at this time of year, Loris uh, is happy to accept those right now. So pass them on. Thanks. Um, would you like to join me in prayer? Let us, let's start off with the words of Psalm 106, the first verse. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. And Lord, this morning we thank and praise you for your great love for us, for our families and church family, for living in a country at peace, for easy access to your word, for sound Bible teachers, that you always hear our prayers, but especially for your death on the cross for us, paying the price for our sins, and guaranteeing those who trust in you to have eternal life. Help us, Lord, as we seek to live for you each day, that we may shine like stars in the universe and hold out the word of life to those who don't yet know you, that you may open their eyes to see your glory, especially, Lord, in a world that is increasingly opposed to Christianity. Guide and help us to think about those of our contacts that we may invite to the September mission or, as Steve mentioned, to the Easter services. And today, Lord, we've heard more about the work of Zambia's child providing an education for the poorest children in that region. Thank you, Lord, for the provision for these children. May their education open the doors of opportunity for them and may they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the staff and the provision of a new boarding house at the school and for those who have sponsored these children and buildings. Help us, Lord, to be generous out of our own abundance to help the needy and disadvantaged. And we also bring before you, Lord, our other link missionaries for Simon and Jess Cowell in Bari, Italy, as they prepare to come to Australia for home leave. For Andrew and Beck in the Middle East, 
using soccer as an outreach strategy for James and Brittany Damon starting their mission of spreading the gospel in Kobar, the Tumaini ministry in Kenya, and for Brendan Garlett at the Shoalhaven Aboriginal Church. Please, Lord, sustain these your faithful people as they strive to share your saving power and love in many different situations and for the work of your spirit to prepare people's hearts to receive this message of salvation. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in our support of them, both prayerfully and financially. And Lord, we thank you for the children and young people in our parish and for those who lead this work, for the family weekend uh, last week that we've just heard about. We pray for them as they do life together. We pray, Lord, for them as they raise their children, that these children will be committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ throughout their lives. We pray for the training of young leaders in children's ministry at this service and for another female leader to help the girls in the Insight group. And for John and Dan, Amy and Sam, as they lead the Insight group, and for all those involved in this strategic ministry. Thank you, Lord, for our leaders here in Jeringon, for Steve and Lorna, John and Fiona. May you daily guide, strengthen, and sustain them in this ministry to which you have called them. And Lord, we bring before you those who are unwell or suffering in some way. For Beth, for Gay Weir, for Dennis and Jan, Jan for Loris, for Kevin and Judy O'Sullivan, and others known to us, that you will be with them in this time of need. And Lord, there is so much need in our world, and we pray that you will restrain the hands of those who promote violence and bloodshed. Especially we pray for peace in the Ukraine, for those countries where your people are persecuted, and help your people to stand firm in their belief, especially where the compromise of biblical truths is at stake, in particular for the Church of England in England, as some ministers make a stand on this issue and consider their options for the future. So Lord Jeringong is where you have placed each of us to live as your people. So what you require of us in this coming week, please help us to ask act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God and Saviour. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That word that uh, stays with me is living life together. And by God's grace, we have the opportunity to live life together here in Jeringong or wherever you come from, particularly at schools or universities, and living life together to support each other. And this song um, identifies a whole lot of things about life and about God's gift to us. And one of the lines in this song is going to be preached about, I was blind, but now I see. Um, I think that we can stand. And then there's a video following this about John 9. Yeah. 
As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is they, you must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Night is coming. When no one can work. <laughs> While I am in the world, I am the light for the world. <laughs> After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes. Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means scent. some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash my face. So I went, and as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he? I don't know. Then they took to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. The day that Jesus made the mud and cured him of his blindness was a Sabbath. then asked the man again how he had received his sight. He put some mud on my eyes. I washed my face. And now I can see. The man who did this cannot be from God. For he does not obey the Sabbath law. How could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? And there was division among them. You say he cured you of your blindness. Well, what do you say about him? He is a prophet. The Jewish authorities, however, were not willing to believe that he had been blind and could now see until they called his parents. Is this your son? You say that he was born blind. How is it then that he can now see? We know that he is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But we don't know how it is that he is now able to see, nor do we know who cured him of his blindness. Ask him. He is old enough and he can answer for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities who had already agreed that anyone who said he believed that Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. 
That is why his parents said, he is old enough, ask him. A second time, they called back the man who had been born blind. Promise before God that you will tell the truth. We know that this man who cured you is a sinner. I do not know if he is a sinner or not. One thing I do know. I was blind. And now I see. What did he do to you? How did he cure you of your blindness? I have already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Maybe you too would like to be his disciples. They insulted him and said, You are that fellow's disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for that fellow, however, we do not even know where he comes from. What a strange thing that is. You do not know where he comes from, but he cured me of my blindness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to people who respect him and do what he wants them to do. Since the beginning of the world, nobody has ever heard of anyone giving sight to a person born blind. Unless this man came from God, he would not be able to do a thing! You were born and brought up in sin! And you are trying to teach us. And they expelled him from the synagogue. Jesus heard what had happened. He found the man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Tell me who he is, sir, so that I can believe in him. You have already seen him. And he is the one who is talking with you now. I believe, Lord. And he knelt down before Jesus. I came to this world to judge, so that the blind should see and those who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, Surely you don't mean that we are blind too. If you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you can see, this means that you are still guilty. I wonder how many of you like courtroom dramas, whether it's, uh, I don't know, Rumpole of the Bailey, is that some people's thing, or Rafferty's Rules, is that going, going back? For, or maybe something like To Kill a Mockingbird, or A Few Good Men, uh, something like Twelve Angry Men, or The Twelve is on Netflix at the moment, or Binge, or one of those, uh, or maybe something a bit more light-hearted, uh, Legally Blonde, uh, you know. Or the castle. I know when I was at law school, uh, if you didn't know the answer to a question that the lecturer asked, you would just say it was the vibe. Uh, and you could tell the lecturers who had seen the movie and those who hadn't. Uh, they're very popular, these sorts of movies, but courtroom dramas or, or jury duty. Maybe you don't like watching those shows, but you've had to be on a jury at some point in your life. Uh, the reason these dramas are, are so popular, whether it's books or plays or movies or TV shows, is this the very dramatic process, lots of emotion and plot twists and all that sort of thing, this process of establishing the facts, asking the questions, discussing and analysing an event or a crime, and then working out how the law is going to respond, how the court is going to respond. Uh, and that's actually a process we find in this truly awesome chapter in John's Gospel, uh, chapter 9. Uh, I describe it as awesome because of the awesome truths that it contains. Uh, it's, it's awesome also because of the way John uses these, these descriptions, uh, his description of events, to not only focus our attention on who Jesus is and what he claims for himself, but it also focuses on the crucial process of answering these questions for ourselves responding to these truths ourselves. 
You see, what we have here is something we're very used to when we read our Bibles, uh, maybe because of Sunday school or youth group or scripture or something like that, or because we do read our Bibles, but it's a normal miracle episode, isn't it? It's a normal miracle scene. It's just what we expect. This is what Jesus does. Uh, he turns up somewhere, he sees someone in need, and he does something amazing. That's kind of normal, except here something different happens because we hear what happens next for the person who has been healed. Often they just go off to live their wonderful new life uh, and the attention stays on Jesus. But here, Jesus disappears for a while and we actually spend time finding out what happened next as this person you know, process what happened, as the people around them kind of deal with this new reality. Um, it's a bit like uh, a scene, I was reminded when I was preparing the sermon of a uh, less uh, you know, intense movie than the ones I've mentioned before. Um, I don't know if you saw the movie Austin Powers back in the day. It's a send up of all those spy movies. Uh, but, and as is the case in lots of spy movies, you know, Austin Powers is fighting the bad guys. There's lots of evil henchmen around. He's you know, killing this one, killing that one, you know, as happens in these movies. And then one particular henchman dies, and then instead of just carrying on with the adventure, the, the camera switches to kind of documentary interviews with the henchman's wife and his family and his friends, and just the focus on, you know, no one thinks about what happens to the family of the evil henchman when they get killed in these... It's very funny at the time, but it's the sort of same process we find here. Uh, this chapter is as much about the response to the miracle as the miracle itself. In fact, most of the chapter is about the response. And that raises the question for us as we deal with big questions, the fair questions that get asked of Jesus here in John's Gospel. What do you do? How do you respond to the miracles and claims of Jesus? Uh, so let's pray and then get into that. Heavenly Father, uh, on this hot morning, we pray that you would free our minds from distraction. We pray that your light of truth would shine into our hearts, that we would go from here knowing more about your son and knowing how we should respond. Amen. Okay, so John starts with the miracle. Here we see the light of the world bringing light, bringing sight to a man who has been born blind. Uh, now, this happens immediately after... You know, the end of chapter 8, it's chapter one, uh, verse 1 of chapter 9. And if you remember, what's happened is that the Pharisees have been so angry at Jesus for what he's been claiming uh, that they've actually tried to kill him. They've tried to stone him and he has uh, miraculously just eluded them. Now, we're not sure if this is immediately afterwards as he's walking away from the temple or maybe there's been a passage of time. But if it is immediately afterwards, uh, it's quite remarkable that instead of kind of, you know, recovering from, you know, an attempt on his life, his focus is straight away on this one individual and showing compassion to this one individual. So they're walking along, they see this blind man, and the disciples uh, ask a question, a fair question. When they see someone who is obviously, you know, suffering, who life has not treated well, who uh, is a beggar, who's blind, uh, they ask what seems to them to be the obvious question, the big theological question. Who sinned so that this man was born blind? Because that's how they understood it to work. If you, if you suffer, if you have some sort of disease or disability, whatever it might be, some calamity in your life, it's obviously because you've sinned or maybe your parents have sinned. That seems to them to be the way it works. So the disciples ask, who sinned? That's their fair question. But this is actually a wrong take on this whole big issue of suffering. And don't worry, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to deal with the issue of suffering today. Uh, it's a wrong take on suffering, although it is a common assumption and approach. You see, it is true that all suffering in the world generally is the result of sin, is the result of the fall. We can say that that's true generally. There are also times in the Bible when specific suffering is identified as the direct result of specific sin. But we don't have enough information as just normal people to be able to look at a particular instance of suffering 
and join the dots. We don't have enough information to identify which individual sin has caused that particular individual suffering. Only God can do that. And so that's why we have particular instances in the Bible where suffering is directly caused by sin. An obvious example is you know, the people of Judah you know, having their city destroyed and taken off into exile because they had turned away from God. Uh, that's specifically linked. But the, the link is made by God. He's the one who's able to identify you know, when it is caused by sin and when it is not. Only God knows, which is why we should be very careful about trying to do that. But also it's why Jesus is able to answer their question. He knows. And his answer is that this man was born blind not because of a particular sin. In fact, this man was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed, be displayed in him. And so this theological question that the disciples ask actually raises more questions as Jesus answers it. Because Jesus, in answering, also says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And there's so many big things contained in those few short sentences. Raises even more questions about who Jesus is. He claims to have been sent. Sent by who? We can read that and go, well, obviously God. But that wasn't so obvious. Uh, he says he's got work to do. Well, what is his work? Is it going around healing? Or is there more to it than that? Is are the healings just about causing good to the individual? Or are they signs pointing to some bigger truth? He says that he's only going to be around for an amount of time. That it's day now, but the night is coming. What does he mean by that? What is this time frame? What, what is involved in this night? Now, obviously, we know, with the benefit of having read John's Gospel and hindsight and all that sort of thing, that he's talking about the cross that he has work to do now, which is to get them ready for his ultimate work of salvation, of doing these signs and making these claims so that they'll understand what happens on the cross and in the tomb. And finally, this statement he makes about himself, he is the light of the world, what does this mean? I mean, it seems a really easily understood metaphor it's a really powerful one. If you've ever been in the dark and the lights suddenly come on, maybe, you know, the headlights suddenly come on of a parked car or one of those sensor lights goes on or whatever it might be, uh, the difference is amazing. Darkness and then there is light. And of course, that's exactly what's happened for this blind man or this ex-blind man, as we should say. To answer these questions, Jesus actually takes action. And so as they're thinking about what, he, what he's meaning by all of this, he actually does something. He spits on the ground, makes some mud with the saliva and puts it on the man's eyes. Go, he says, wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man goes and washes and comes home seeing. And this wonderful, powerful miracle, we should never be complacent about these just because we've read it lots of time or watched it on a video. There's so much going on here. There's echoes of the power of God in creation in the use of clay which is what God made Adam from there's the power and compassion of God at work this man who's been blind his entire life has now got this whole new life of vision and participation in society and ability to actually thrive in a way he couldn't before because all he could do to survive economically was to beg. And there's also this big issue of being sent. Jesus claims to have been sent by someone and he wants them to think about that by first of all sending the man to Siloam and also choosing a place where the, word, the name itself means sent. This particular pool is called the sent pool because the water was sent from a spring on the other side of the hill that the temple was on through a tunnel that's been dug through the hill. Uh, so this is the scent pool where the water is sent. And so as we read this, we're thinking, send, send, send. What, who, what does this mean? And of course we have light coming into darkness, light defeating darkness. 
as a clue to who Jesus is. But of all the questions that this encounter raises, the big question is one that the Pharisees ask in the courtroom drama, and we're about to get into the courtroom drama, don't worry. The big question is, what do you say about him? What have you to say about him? You see, this goes beyond asking, what does Jesus claim about himself? What does the Bible say about Jesus? What does this miracle show or prove about him? What do you say about him? What do you believe? How do you respond to what we're reading here? And so to explore this dynamic, we get to our courtroom drama. Now, this particular courtroom drama has lots of questions. And what is really highlighted are the responses to who Jesus is and in particular what he's done here and what he's claimed. And with any good courtroom drama, before you get to court, you have the preliminary investigation and the initial questions. And these come from the neighbours and friends of the man who's been healed. Because when they see him, who they know is the blind beggar, he's been doing this his whole life. Many of them would have grown up only knowing him as the one who sits by the side of the road and begs. They ask, you know, what's going on here? Who, isn't this the one who begs? Now, initially, when faced with this astounding transformation, they look for explanations other than a miracle from God. Oh, it can't be him. It must be someone who looks like him, who looks exactly like him apart from the eyes. Maybe his long-lost twins turned up or a visiting cousin or to some random who happens to look like him. But eventually, when they grapple with the fact that this is actually him, he talks to them and proves it. They would have heard his voice, all that sort of thing, you know, many times. When they realise that, in fact, this must be from God, then what they do is they take it to the experts. Although in the, in the video it has the man kind of being brought in, you know, in chains or as a prisoner, uh, probably what's happened is that when they're faced with something big and spiritual and obviously from God, they need to take this to the experts. And that's the Pharisees. Now, we're very down on the Pharisees. They're always the bad guys. But back then, they were highly regarded. They were regarded as the ones who knew the law and taught the law and tried to live out the law. And it might be that they've got a wrong take on it all and we can see that their approach is all wrong. But generally in the community, if you had a spiritual problem, this is who you took it to. So the neighbours take this man to the Pharisees, to the teachers of the law, because they want an explanation. Has God done this? What's going on? This has never happened. They've never heard of someone who was born blind now being able to see. But when they're faced with this situation, when they start asking the questions and finding out the facts, the Pharisees... As I said, they have this wrong approach. Their response is very hostile. So apart from what we've seen with the neighbours trying to find the explanation elsewhere than this comes from God, they're, they're really sceptical. They're really hostile. They know that this cannot be from God. How could it possibly be from God? Because we know Jesus is a sinner. See, they already think something about Jesus. They already have their opinion of Jesus and it's negative. They refuse to admit that he is the son of God, that he is the Messiah, the King God promised, the Christ. And so they will not allow for any information to change that opinion. He is a sinner. How do they know that he's a sinner? Well, it's really obvious. Spitting is disgusting. I mean, not just from a manners perspective, from a ritual, spiritual perspective, coming into contact with someone else's saliva made you ritually unclean. So he's doing something that is against the law. He's making the blind man unclean. That's a sinful thing to do. And spitting is also working. And it was the Sabbath day. Making clay is working, kneading anything, whether it's dough or clay, is working on the Sabbath day. Healing was working. You are only allowed to heal someone, whether it was miraculous healing or doing, you know, 
medicine as it was back in the day, the only form you could do was something that was life-saving. If someone's life was in danger, you could do something to save their life. But if it could wait, then it waited for the next day. And this could wait. This guy had been blind his whole life. He could go another day and then be healed the next day. So healing him was working. Ordering him to go to the pool was probably working. You know, and the man going to the pool, that was working. So Jesus has made him you know, sin as well. So he claims to be the Messiah, but he's obviously a sinner. He's a lawbreaker. And God would not raise up the Messiah, someone who is a lawbreaker. And claiming to be the Messiah itself, how dare he? How dare someone who, they don't even know where he comes from. He's not one of them. He doesn't have the fancy theological degree and the history, the, the reputation of being a teacher of the law and all that sort of thing. He's an outsider. He's a no one from nowheresville. There's no way he can be the Messiah. And so sure of they, in all of their knowledge, that there's no way Jesus can be the Messiah, based on all they know of God's law, that they're completely blind to the big clue that this is the Messiah. Because three times in the book of Isaiah, a clue is given that when the Messiah comes, the blind will see. So here they had this massive clue. It's like big neon pointing arrows and hands going like this. Here is the Messiah. The blind can see. And their hostility to Jesus blinds them to it. Spiritual blindness. They're like blind optometrists. They're supposedly the teachers of the law, the religious leaders, the guides of God's people, yet they're blind and they can lead no one. So that's the second kind of response to this question. What do you have to say to him? And then we have the response of the parents who are brought in to you know, verify that this is actually their son and he was actually blind and he can now see. Maybe because, like is often the case, when someone has a disability, we assume all sorts of other problems. So someone has some form of disability, well, they must be intellectually disabled as well, and we can treat them as though they're stupid. So we can't possibly rely on what this man says, even though he's an adult, and he can probably tell that he was blind and now he's not. So they bring in the parents, and apart from verifying, yes, this is our son, and yes, he was blind, they don't want anything more to say. They don't want to be involved in this. See, they're obviously, I would assume, over the moon at this miracle. They know that God has worked powerfully here. But they're scared about the consequences of owning that, of proclaiming that, of taking a stand on that, of the public impact. So even though they know God has been at work, they'd rather just not be known in this situation. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to be excluded from the synagogue because so convinced have the Pharisees been that Jesus is not the Messiah that they've said anyone who says he's the Messiah gets kicked out of the synagogue, which was the very heart of the community, the, the central part of life for God's people. It's a huge consequence. And so they won't own up to what they know to be true, that this is the Messiah or that this definitely is from God even if they haven't put all the rest together. They're too afraid of the consequences socially. And finally, we get to the blind man himself, or the ex-blind man himself. See, at the start, he doesn't know Jesus. And then when Jesus comes into his life, we actually see his understanding change over a period of time. See, he knows that a miracle has happened. He, of all people, knows that God has done something amazing. But he's trying to process what that means about the man who did it. See, knowing that the miracle has happened doesn't give him all the answers straight away. But knowing that this miracle has happened gives him an unshakable understanding that God has been at work, which gives him the courage and the words to answer back to the Pharisees. Because think about who he is. He's been blind his whole life. He wouldn't have received an education. Maybe he's heard and memorised you know, the word of God and that sort of thing, but 
he wouldn't have been given an education. He's certainly never been involved in public speaking and debating and, you know, in court, you know, against the opposing lawyers and all that sort of thing. Yet here he is, standing toe to toe, giving just as good as he's getting, if not better. But he's still trying to figure out what is going on. And so we see this kind of process, this progression of his understanding in the way he talks about Jesus. He starts by talking about the man they call Jesus. He's a man. Then he'll say he's a prophet. He's someone who's obviously been sent from God with some sort of message or gift. Then he goes on to say he's a teacher of the law, worthy of having his own disciples, a teacher of the word of God. Then he actually describes him as being from God. Then he describes him as the Son of Man, the Lord, the Saviour. So we see in him this wonderful progression as he thinks through it and, and works it out and puts together the information, the evidence that he has, going from not knowing Jesus to seeing Jesus for who he is. And so the courtroom drama ends with the Pharisees kicking the man out, not just of the courtroom, but probably of the synagogue as well. And so refusing to acknowledge Jesus and the, the miraculous thing that has happened, they vent their rage on this poor man who's now, having been excluded most of his life, finally gets in and now he's out again. But that's when Jesus comes back into the story. Jesus has been absent, but now he seeks out this man. He goes to find him to make sure that he actually gets the full picture. And we see Jesus asking this man some big questions. You know, do you know the Son of Man? Do you have faith in him? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, the Son of Man is not just you know, a phrase Jesus happens to use. It comes straight from the Old Testament. It's the one that God is going to put in charge for the rest of eternity. He's the king that God has chosen. It's another way of talking about the Messiah. And see, this is all about this exchange with Jesus is all about the response. How do you respond? This man, he responds by worshipping Jesus as Lord. He's come all the way and put his faith in Jesus. And when the Pharisees see this, they're you know, again, they're outraged. They might be being described as blind. We're not blind. And he says, well, if you're not blind, if you can see clearly, then that makes you even more guilty because you've got all the information and you still won't believe in me. You see, it's all about the response to what Jesus has done and what he's claimed. Who do you say he is? What do you have to say about him? What do you Believe. How do you respond to the miracles and the claims of Jesus? So I started by talking about fictional courtroom dramas and fictional juries. But I've also worked in a real-life courtroom, which is very different to the courtroom dramas you watch on the screen. Partly because most of the lawyers aren't nearly as good-looking as those actors who play them in the movies. But a also, there's an awful lot of mind-numbingly boring legal argument that you don't get in those amazing courtroom dramas. But most importantly, real-life courtrooms don't have actors playing the roles of lawyers and judges and juries and parties. They have real people. And the arguments and the questions and the decisions involve real people. Real lives are changed for better or for worse. And if you've ever had to be on a jury, you know that you have to make decisions that ruin or redeem someone's life. You've got to weigh up the evidence and make the call. The judge has to weigh up the evidence and make this decision that impacts someone from then on. And so I want to conclude with the reminder that this courtroom drama that we find in John chapter 9 actually does impact on real lives too. Not just the real lives of the people back then. It impacts on our lives. And like real judges and juries, we have to weigh up the evidence and make a decision. We have to respond. Because the same question is asked of us. What have you to say about him? What do you think about Jesus? What do you believe? How do you respond? And do you respond like the neighbours did? Looking for any explanation other than the truth? 
just unwilling to admit that maybe God is actually at work here, that God is real and that Jesus is real and he has actually saved us. There's got to be some other explanation. Is that what we do? Is that what you do? Or do you respond like many of the Pharisees did, with hostility, so convinced you already know about Jesus and you've already rejected him, that you will not be changed, you will not listen to any evidence to the contrary, so convinced that you know best, so determined that your way is right, so sceptical about anything that challenges your understanding of the world or your sense of your own righteousness, so convinced that you see the world so clearly that you are in fact blind to the truth about Jesus. Is that how you respond? Or do you respond like the parents? Despite what you do know about Jesus, despite feeling, thinking that there is actually something of God going on here, despite all that seems to be right there and right in front of you, are you afraid of actually taking that step, of what that might mean, of the, the consequences to your life? Taking a stand might mean people don't like you anymore or are critical of you or you face some sort of opposition or ridicule or that you might actually have to make decisions that impact on your lifestyle or is that how you respond? Or do you respond like the blind man, the one whose eyes have been opened and who gradually puts it together over time with the dawning understanding that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour? I know that many people here have put their faith in Jesus, which is a source of great joy, but there might be some who haven't. And so that's the challenge for you today. But the challenge for those who've already put their faith in Jesus is that all around us there are people who are responding like the neighbours and the Pharisees and the parents. And we've got to do the work that our Lord has given us to show them who Jesus is. We have to reflect his light or that his light shine through us so that when they look at us, they see him in our words and our deeds. Because a verdict is coming for all of us, for all of them. A verdict determined by the real question that's asked here, the ultimate question, as Jesus himself asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for who you are, a God of love and mercy and power and compassion, a God of justice and of grace. We thank you, Lord, for your word and your spirit. We thank you for John's gospel and for this event recounted, or these events recounted in chapter 9. We thank you, Lord, that you loved this man so much you healed his blindness. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, not just into the blind man's life, but into the world, that the world might be saved. And so, Lord, as we think of all the different ways people can respond to you, we ask that everyone here would respond in faith. And we ask, Lord, for those of us who do see, who have had the light, change our darkness. We pray, Lord, that you would shine through us, that all those around us would see Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom and courage. We pray, Lord, that you would work in us and through us, that others might have a dawning understanding of who your son is and come to believe in him. We ask all this in his name. Amen. I love this blind man. Gives an uppercut to the Pharisees. Maybe you want to become one of his disciples. He is just so sarcastic. Um, not that sarcasm is great at times, but uh, I love the way he gives it back to them. I was once blind, spiritually born blind. I needed a work of God in my life. And I needed my sins washed away. Jesus washed them away for me many years ago and continues to do that on a daily basis. If Jesus has done that for you, you have this living hope within you. Let's sing.
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Today brings Sabbath rest to your heart and your home. May God's image in you be restored and our imagination in God be restored. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the relativity of time slowed down. May we know God's grace to embrace and our own finite smallness in the arms of God's infinite greatness. May God's word feed us and his spirit lead us in the week and the life to come. Amen. 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 If you would like prayer, we offer prayer at the end of the service. If you would like to come to the front for you or a loved one. Otherwise, we have the best morning tea in town. So please <laughs> partake of that. Thanks for coming today. <laughs>